Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the peaceful Bosporus and the capital city of Constantinopolis. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Total War Attila, the Eastern Roman Empire and History. And what's funny is as I was loading up this campaign, there was a title quote, Every instant of time is a pinprick of eternity. And it was by Marcus Aurelius. So that was very inspiring. Where we find ourselves at this moment is we have just beaten the Alans up here in what is referred to as Moesia Inferior, the northern Danube frontier. And we now have a group of Roxolanians who are on a boat. And we don't know exactly where they're headed, so we have to be cautious. Let's actually get our emperor moving toward the city. Though he can't move far. We'll stay in Marcianopolis for the time being. So we have lots of money. This is a new turn. But again, I want to spend it in ways that will make us more money in the future. I've put a lot of money and effort into the Isles. They now have good sanitation and good farming. However, without a technological improvement, I can't improve the farming further. I can, however, improve the two jetties that we have to either military, trade, or fishing. Now, trade, of course, will give us the most money, but fishing will give us not only money, but food. So in this case, 50 food plus 450 wealth, whereas this will give us 900 wealth and no food. We are doing okay in terms of food, but with raiding and things like that, things can change quite rapidly. So what I believe I'm going to do is split the difference, and I'm going to create one trade jetty and one fishing jetty. It's a shame that because these are island cities that at least one of the four buildings you produce has to be a sea building. Although, Crete doesn't appear to have one of those, so maybe I'm wrong on that. Nope, never mind. Trade jetties. I don't want to spend any money moving down the auditorium path because as you proceed in the technological tree of the Eastern Roman Empire, you'll notice that you lose things. Like, for example, if I research the Imperial Church, I disable the legacy molded architecture which gives us the circus, the great theater, and the imperial library, and so on and so forth. I lose the natural philosophy. I lose the improved plumbing, which sucks, because I lose the cloacas and the aqueducts, and I lose the concrete. And that's as you move forward in the... You lose concrete last here with divine right. So for some reason, as you progress in civic technology of Christianity you lose construction and sanitary improvements. Which, okay, <laughs> let's go with it, it's a game. So in this episode, I want to start speaking about the Emperor Diocletian. And you might wonder why, Marcus, when the Emperor Diocletian was the Emperor of the Roman Empire from many hundreds of years ago, and not at all related to the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire. But you would be incorrect. In fact, the first thing I want to do in this episode is pose the question of when did the Byzantine Empire begin? Or, more specifically, when should history start discussing it? Ooh, look at you. You can... To influence? That's not that valuable. Let's give him some public order instead. And this is an interesting question, because... The Eastern Roman Empire kind of evolved over time. It never really started. And so the question of when historians should begin discussing it as a separate entity from the Western Roman Empire or the traditional Old Roman Empire is a good one. Some historians start with when Constantine the Great founded the city of Constantinopolis or New Rome on the site of ancient Byzantium. That took place in 324 AD. Others believe it should start when the German general Odasser deposed the last Western Roman Empire, Romulus Augustulus, and claimed Italy as a kingdom for himself, which took place in 476. And still others say that 
you really shouldn't start talking about the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire until it loses most of Egypt and the East and is reduced to just Anatolia and Thrace by the Arab Caliphate conquests in the 7th century. The rationale going that at this point, it becomes less of a Roman Empire and more of a medieval Christian Greek Empire. But both Treadgold and Brownworth believe, or at least they start their histories, in the reign of Diocletian. And they start that with his ascension to the role of emperor in the year 284. Oh, our little guy down here can also gain some rank. He is a scholar. You know, I'm going to go with that, because research is important, and frankly, sir, you aren't that much right now. Although I may use you later to wage war against some of these provinces here, or south of Egypt. For right now, you're just on watch, in case there's any navies coming from the northwest, which did happen in my test game. So we're, we're kind of low on money. Let's just... Well, we could recruit more troops, I suppose. And with this gentleman who ha wait, no, I think this is the guy who has the experience benefit to the troops, doesn't he? No, he's the handler. So that must be this guy. Yes. Okay, so you're going to recruit for us. Not mercenaries, but regular units. Let's go with two cohorts. That's all we can afford. And since we cannot yet produce archers anywhere, I will get a unit of peltists. Though I really want to have archers pretty soon. Maybe next turn we'll spend some of that money to create an archery barracks somewhere. Okay. Things are still quiet and nice with the Persians. We'll take a quick look at the diplomacy. In fact, one thing I may want to do is see if I can turn Armenia into a client kingdom. So Armenia. We have trade and our relationship is deteriorating. Why? Because we're a great power and because you have a cultural aversion to us. That is no good. I guess turning you into a dependency is not going to... Welcome, friend. Welcome. Come. Oh, wait. Are you already a dependency? The pleasures of my home and let us find no. No, 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 no. You are a puppet state of the Sassanids right now. I don't think you started that way. But that's, that's trouble. Who are our puppet states? That's trade. We have Nobatia and Lazica. There's Lazica and Nabatia's down here. That's not very helpful to us in this instance. All right, whatever. Let's go back to the Persians or the Sassanids. We are friendly and improving. Let's see if we can get some trade. Why not? The pleasures of my household are yours to enjoy. Success. Moderately. Do we have any money? We could just use all the rest of our money to sweeten the pot. 61. Well, okay. Our haggling must, I no, they still don't want to trade with us. And this is the guy that likes us. When he dies, his son will hate us and then there will be trouble. But that's as much as I want to do this turn. So let's end the turn. So Diocletian was actually, before he became the Emperor Diocletian, was a farmer from the region of Illyricum in the city of Salona, which is the modern-day city of Split in Croatia. His name was Diocles, which is interesting because it's Greek. And even though he accepted a Latin name as he became Emperor, if he is of Greek ancestry, it would mean that he is the first Greek Emperor of Rome. And... His father was a scribe, a freedman, so a relatively low status. However, Diocles rose through the ranks of the army to eventually become the leader of the Protectoris Domestici, or the Emperor's bodyguard, for the Emperor Carus. Now, in 283, Carus led an attack on the Persians and, of course, brought Diocles with him. What happened here at this point is kind of a mystery. Carus died. It's said, kind of romantically, that he died by a thunderstrike, but many people assume he was assassinated. By whom? No one knows. And at that time, his son... Alan's tried to do something to us, but failed critically. 
His son, Numerian, took over and retreated from Persian lands. But Numerian himself also was assassinated in Asia Minor, Anatolia, this area. And at that point, Diocles apparently, and I'm using finger quotes here, caught the assassin, executed the assassin, and then took over the Imperium for himself, was acknowledged as emperor by his troops. Now, what's interesting about that is that we don't really know what happened. He could have been totally loyal and did exactly as he said he did, and the emperor was assassinated by someone else and he just took over, or he could have been behind it all himself. Okay, Rufinus has completed his term as a military count. Religious request. The heretics among these people persecute and dishonor the faithful. So I must be at war with the Sassanids in six turns in order to get Greek Christian support. I'm sorry, Greek Christians, but you are just going to have to wait right now. I'm sorry that you've been persecuted. Uh, it sucks, but we're not going to lose the empire on account of you. So at this point in, in 283, 284, you've got a dichotomy. You have Diocles, who is proclaimed emperor in the east, and in the west you have Charis's son by the name of... Um, you know what? I don't know what his son's name is, but... He goes to war with Diocles, and eventually Diocles defeats him and is the sole ruler of the East and West. Alright, so these guys now are coming down the Danube. That's very interesting. So I'm actually going to leave the Emperor. Okay, so his troops are dying. His troops are dying even though we have a food surplus because they have some kind of pestilence or disease. They have consumption. And it lowers our integrity and morale and our troop numbers, and that is no good. I don't know how to get rid of it, either. Is this because of sanitation? But sanitation in this province is good, except for Marcianopolis, where there is also the consumption. I don't know. I'm not sure really what to do here to ease the pain from this. I don't like having two large armies kind of sitting about, but I don't want to conquer anything. Besides, the West hasn't really lost anything yet. We do have the... Is this the... Oh no, I thought it was the Vandals, but it's the Quadians and the Ostrogoths around here. Alright, so maybe we should move up to Viminosium. Okay. We're going to do a little dance with you again. I know, and yet I have you journeying back and forth for Rome instead. Okay. Okay, you're in Marcianopolis. You actually need some reinforcements. Commander. But they're not ready yet. So next turn I'll move this guy up with some reinforcements to reinforce you. But for now, I'm just going to have you scout the frontier. Okay, you learned a lot about the disposition of the enemy. <laughs> and it's too bad about Armenia. And one of these days... When they ever do declare war on us, the Persians, I want to take Nisibis. Although they seem to be losing support there. That'd be awesome if it rebelled. I would love that. What can we do to make this a better battlefield, by the way? We can improve the town, which will give us a better garrison. Here we can improve grapes. We can recruit soldiers here from a rally field. I don't know if I'm going to necessarily be recruiting soldiers from the border. So I might get rid of that at some point. But right now it's fine. And what's the, what's it like, the fertility of this region? It says it's somewhere. Fertility 40. Is that good? I don't even know. Yeah, oh yeah, it's really good. Or actually, yeah. So this whole region is really, really great fertility. However, it's contested. It's going to be raided quite a bit. So I don't want to invest heavily in infrastructure until we've pushed the Persians back at some point later in the campaign. So my priorities right now are increasing our economy and our ability to produce military troops. We are going to do some cavalry here. I think we could start that right now with the cavalry coral. Coral. The corral. Okay. Sanitation is good here. All my cities can be improved, but... Let's find a way to give us some more money. In fact, I think a good way to do that is to get some gold in Egypt. Let's improve this. Can we not? Oh, we don't even have a gold mine. 
I need four population. Oh, well, that sucks. And our farms are already maxed out. Sanitation's still pretty bad in this place, though, so we can improve this. To either a reservoir, which will improve sanitation, wow, in, in public order. Or latrines, sanitation, and growth. Well, we need growth. This might be one instance where I decide to go with the latrines and then later change them to the reservoir when public order becomes a problem. But right now it isn't. And we need growth. So let's go with latrines. So now everybody in Egypt has a place they can poop. Which I'm sure will make them quite happy. Cilicia? Well, I can't afford to do anything right now anyway. So let's just increase our armies by... I don't really want to recruit you guys, but you are cheap. So we'll have three of them, three of them, and three of these guys. Okay. It's a good life. Yes. I don't necessarily know if I agree with that, sir. All right, so we're doing pretty well. We have good food, everybody except for here. Are you kidding me? The islands where my farms are, they import food. Local food shortages, are you? They're the supplier of food to my entire empire. Where do I find that out? Total food, negative 20. Because of our buildings. Well, isn't that something? Here I was... This is going to be my bread basket, and it's actually losing us food. That is amazing. We may have to build another farm in, in Crete. Maybe we'll do that next turn. Okay. So Diocles then in 284 to speak words of strength reply then with a strength that welcomes peace Sure I'm totally happy with that Enjoy your peace So he became can be wearisome unless it brings agreement as here So where's the wine All right thank you now please stop interrupting me So Diocles became the emperor Caesar, Gaius, Aurelius, Valerius, Dio Diocletianus, Augustus, at the end of 2000, 2000, at the end of 284 AD. What he did that was probably he is most notable for is he recognized that the empire was just too big for one person to rule all by themselves. So what he did in result is he created what is known as the Tetrarchy, where he adopted a co-emperor, and later on he decided that each of them should also have a co-Caesar. So instead of one person, there were now four, two senior Augusti, one in the east, one in the west, and two Caesars underneath them, one in the east, one in the west, who would become Augusti after the Caesar or the Augustus of that period died or whatever. Armenia wants to arrange a marriage. Who are you, Arya Flasila? I don't understand. Are you Armenian? You have an heir. Oh no, you want our okay, our girl to marry your heir. And I can't find out who she is? Like who who she's the daughter of? What her deal is? No? That would be very helpful in order to make these negotiations work. They'll pay us 900 for it, however. And she's kind of ill-tempered. She's shrewish, and so she will lose authority with her husband and give him illegitimate children? Sure, why not? And Diocletian did a whole bunch of other stuff, too, besides just instituting the Tetrarchy. He completely organized a brand new taxation system because the old one was basically not working. It was full of inflation and they just sacked the city of, what is that, Ravenna? Yikes. And he completely reorganized and expanded the provincial system where before there was something like 50 provinces, he tripled that and made a whole bunch of small provinces that were all equal in size and population. And then he broke them up into dioceses which were each led by a vicar. So basically what he did was he 
improved the high level management of the empire from one guy who could just be assassinated and everything could turn into chaos to four emperors along with all of the high level administration people that they all had with them. And now God, consumption is everywhere, even though I'm spending all this money on sanitation. Okay, so the Temple of Apollo, is, despite being destroyed by the previous Emperor Theodosius, is still being visited by pilgrims. What are we going to do about that? We can ignore, we can ban the pilgrims, or we can allow them. Ooh, boy. I kind of want to allow them, but that's not very good. Wow, our dominion is terrible. Like, terrible. Hmm. Disperse the pagans, kill any who remain. Uh, I'm not comfortable with that. We could ignore them. Let's just ignore them. That might be the bad choice, but we'll find out. And while we're here, let's take a look at... Okay. So one thing I've learned is that if you promote people with not that many stars over people with have a lot of stars, they get really mad and they might rebel. So this guy is probably my best guy at this point. Let's make him more loyal by making him a military count. Now, we also have the guy here. He is in the east. It's probably a good idea to make him a military count. And... Everyone else, I believe, only has two stars. But if I promoted Rufinus to count, it would make all these other guys upset. So, you're the guy in North Africa, right? Pretty sure that's you. Yeah, Libya. So you can be a count as well. And where are you? You're our recruiter. Yeah, I might as well make you a count, since you're recruiting troops. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. Rufinus is not really going to get any more appointments because it makes everybody else mad. But I do want him to be more powerful. Let's see, what can we do here? We can assassinate him, diminish his popularity, secure his loyalty. Gather support. Seek support from an elite, thereby strengthening your control over the political situation. Where well, our control is pretty good at 68. And our power is balanced. As your power grows, you get more tax, but you lose loyalty. Or you, you may get more loyalty with generals, but you lose public order, yeah. And actually you do lose loyalty. So here you'd have loyalty 1, here you have no loyalty, negative 3 public order, and your growth starts hurting as well. And finally you start losing loyalty. So you really want your power to be balanced if you can control it. Alright, well that will be the end of this episode. Next episode we will speak more about Diocletian, we'll finish him up, and then we'll move on to other emperors after that. Once again, I am Marcus Aurelius. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one.